I'm David O'Connor. I'm the permanent observer of IUCN International Union for Conservation of Nature to the United Nations. Um, maybe I should just quickly, for those of you who don't know, tell you what IUCN is. Thank you. IUCN is an international organization. It's both intergovernmental and non-governmental. We have both governments and NGOs as our members, thousands of members, and many thousands of scientists who work for different commissions of IUCN on species survival, on habitat, uh, ecosystems, on education and communication, and so on. Um, you heard the ambassador uh, earlier this morning refer to this super year of biodiversity, and in that context he mentioned IUCN's World Conservation Congress, which will happen this year in June in Marseille, France. Uh, and this is a four-yearly congress where the leading scientists and conservationists, practitioners from all over the world convene and learn from each other, share experiences, compare notes, and, and basically get inspired to continue their work. Uh, one thing you probably have heard about IUCN, if you haven't heard about the name, is something called the Red List of Threatened Species. And this is the list maintained by IUCN of those species in the world who are at various levels of threat from uh, human activity mostly, uh, from other other stressors or uh, sources of uh, stress, threats of extinction. So um, that is now integrated into the uh, UN's monitoring framework for the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to look at progress on some of those goals, in particular goals 14 and 15 on life underwater and life on land. Um, let me then just very say one other, one other thing before introducing Dale, um, and he can introduce himself more than I can, of course. But um, today I, I heard a lot about uh, interactions between human and wildlife, about the need to take the big picture, look at the interlinkages between poverty and poverty eradication on the one hand, and protection of wildlife and being able to convince people living in proximity to wildlife that it's in their interest to uh, conserve wildlife rather than to uh, combat wildlife and being able to provide alternatives, means of livelihood or means of livelihood associated with wildlife thriving in that environment is of course central. And we've heard some talk about one of the some of the ways that these conflicts can be mitigated, if not completely avoided. And, and I think we'll probably come back to that in a moment. But, but the important point is that uh, sustainable development is the confluence of the economic aspirations of our societies for a better life, but the absolute dependence of all of us on healthy ecosystems and on the natural world to sustain our well-being now and into the future. And so, the fact that this has become the central defining agenda of the United Nations, and I should just as an aside say one thing, I think Ade reminded me that I should say this, but I was actually at the center of the negotiation of the Sustainable Development Goals. I led the team in the United Nations which supported those negotiations. I worked very, very closely with the previous ambassador of Kenya, Macharia Kamau, and the ambassador of Hungary throughout those negotiations. Uh, and so I, I'm very proud you know, to say that I am one of the fathers, if you will, the parents of, of that set of goals and that agenda, which has really, I think, inspired everyone to look at the world differently and to look at, you know, not just human progress on its own terms, but look at it in its relationship with nature, look at the social uh, agenda in, in relation to nature and to, the, to economic progress as well. And so, um, on that note, I'll, I'll pass it over to Dale, and Dale is a professor of uh, philosophy and environmental studies at New York University, and looking at his bio, I see he's also had a 
an outstanding career teaching in other universities, including the University of Colorado at Boulder, and uh, has written many, many interesting uh, papers and books on environmental ethics, on a whole range, on animal welfare, and a whole range of other topics. So I'll pass it to Dale, and he can take it over. Okay, thank you, David. Um, well, first, I want to give a big shout out again for Adi, who's made you know all of this possible in this kind of um, Now, so so I want to just take four or five minutes at the outset, just to kind of frame the discussion and sort of get some pings out on the on the table that we might want to follow up on. Um, so David, so I am a philosopher by disciplinary training. I often say I'm undisciplined by temperament, however. Um, and, and, you know, I always say if you want the straight story about anything, you should ask a philosopher. And that's because whoever gets the money as a result, it won't be the philosopher. So you're the only one who can sort of, you know, you can count on to sort of, to sort of tell it how it is. So I'm going to begin by just taking, by saying some things that I think are true. Um, that helped to frame the discussion, uh, and they, they might sound depressing, but I, but I think you know we're adults, uh, uh, even the youth among us, and um, and we need to we need to look our situation in the eye. So first of all, we live in a world that's characterized by extreme and radical inequality, both across nations, but even more predominantly and increasingly within nations. So everything we do in this world, every action that we try to take to make the world better <coughs> is conditioned by that inequality. Secondly, we live in a world which is uh, extremely unstable um, politically, and we face a number of high-risk challenges. So we've, we've talked a little bit about, about climate change, for example, but really, in the background, it's an even larger risk, and that's the risk of nuclear war. Even a small nuclear exchange between two countries would be radically more disruptive of global climate than the disruption that we're likely to see without the, uh, the small nuclear exchange. Now, millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, have been victims of this radical inequality, of this political instability. But more than anything, animals have been victims of these human conflicts and human arrangements and human alterations of the environment of which they haven't had a part. And when we talk about conservation, I, I, I think we don't really know what we're talking about. That's kind of a name for a whole cluster of issues and problems that we can come back to. But we're sort of gesturing at the, at, at the rest of the living world, what I like to call the more than human world, which in a sense uh, is moving towards the sixth extinction because of what humanity is doing to each other. Now, against that background, we reach for technology, you know, uh, especially maybe in the United States, technology is, to use a kind of football metaphor, is always the Hail Mary pass, right? When we don't know what else to do, we want technology to save us, we'll invoke technology. And in fact, technology can be super important. So in my department, for example, one of my colleagues, Jennifer Jacquet, uh, has developed a piece of software called WildEye which is a worm that goes out into the internet and identifies sites that are selling CITES banned animal parts. And it's being used by various law enforcement agencies around the world. And on the so-called supply side, uh, you know, we can talk about drones, for example, we can talk about all kinds of things that are being used to try to uh, help bring um, poaching under control. But it is important, I think, to recognize that at its best, technology is, is, a, is a means. There's nothing about technology that makes it intrinsically good. It's another tool that can be used for various purposes. And in fact, the kind of radical inequality that I'm talking about is in part driven by te technological development and who has captured the benefits of that technological development. 
And for that matter, even when it comes to animals, technology can be used in their interests or against their interests. For example, there's been uh, work that's been done in Australia where there's been, particularly in the West Coast, where sharks have been, have been tagged. You know, these days to be an animal is to be tagged. If you're not tagged, you don't really exist in the animal world, right? Um, but what's happened is that tagging and monitoring system has actually been used to kill sharks that have been seen as threats to humans. So rather than educate the humans to stay away from the sharks, it's easier just to kill the sharks. So here's a case where a technology that looks like it helps us understand the behavior and know them better can actually be used against the interests of the animals. Now, I just want to end by just putting two other issues uh, on the table. I mean, te again, technology is a tool. But what I think is really driving this conservation crisis is really two things. One thing uh, has to do with the unintended consequences of our actions due to long and quite obscure supply chains. So when I go to my little cell phone shop on Broadway, for example, and buy a cell phone, I don't mean to be disrupting um, a mining community in some part of the world. I don't mean to be setting in motion a chain of events that will create a new road in what was otherwise a protected area that will disrupt the local economy in various ways and reward new certain lifestyles uh, as opposed to traditional livelihoods and all of that. But everything we do by way of consumption has these unintended consequences. So in that sense, the logic of the I think it's better to call it the extinction problem, really, than the conservation problem, is really the same as the logic of the climate change problem. Nobody intends to change the climate. It's just the consequences of all of these actions that we do in trying to live a certain kind of good life, which involves high consumption. The second issue that I really do want to put on the table is the conservation issue, the extinction problem, is also a problem of values. How much really do we value the animals with which we share the planet? If we, when we say, for example, that wildlife must, must pay its way, or that the way to protect animals is by auctioning off some of them just for trophy hunting purposes and so on and so forth, I mean, that's a statement about the kind of value that we place on those animals. And we can argue whether that's right or whether that's wrong or whatever. But to a great extent, the challenge we face poses the question squarely in our eyes, do we think that we, humans, are the superior species that has a right to dominate the planet and other forms of life should only exist at our pleasure? Or do we think that, in fact, there should be something that looks a little more like species egalitarianism along with human egalitarianism? Uh, to to Dale's point about technologies, um, possibly exacerbating inequalities and, and leading to perverse outcomes like you know, using tags to identify dangerous predators or you know, animals that will harm humans. Um, I was thinking earlier uh, about how the democratization of technology that has been made possible by the affordability of mobile phones, for example, has put tremendous computing power into the hands of ordinary Africans uh, and others around the world, including many, many farmers and others living in, uh, in Africa. And how that technology could be used for good, uh, both in the cause of improving the livelihoods of those people, as it already is, through uh, M-Pesa and other you know, mobile banking, uh, platforms, but also through the possibility to look at how you could actually use mobile payments to provide monetary incentive. And I'm an economist and I, I know money isn't everything, but it does actually make an important difference if you can convince people that this would actually help pay for food for their families or clothes or, or books for their children, whatever. If you could actually think about using that technology and things like crowdfunding platforms to make people who care about the environment in the developed world 
to the people who can actually make a difference on the ground in the developing world through direct transfers of, of payments for services provided in one way or another to protect species, to protect habitat for species, to, you know, to, to work uh, for some of the things that we're trying to achieve through a forum like this. So that's a question, and I'd like to hear Gail's uh, you know, reply to that, but also hear what you have to say. Maybe some of you are a technologist, uh, and maybe you're already doing this. I don't know. Um, so that's one. The second, well, let, let's, let's start with that, okay? I don't want to be late. Um, okay, I'll just be quick and say one thing. is I agree that technology has, an, has enormous potential for good, and what happens when we develop technology, we're sort of imagining, imagine the internet, information wants to be free. We sort of imagine the, the liberatory and emancipatory power of these things. The problem is that in the, in, again, this isn't a criticism, it's meant to just be analytic. In the kind of economic system in which we live, technologies are not developed for altruistic purposes to make the world a better place. Technologies are developed for people to make profits. And what that means is that those technologies then essentially get implemented in a way that reproduces the existing power relations. And so potentially emancipatory technologies like the internet, like social media and so on, we become disappointed in the way that they're used when we discover that they're being used essentially to promote private interests. But we shouldn't be surprised. That's just simply part of the game given the economic and political organization of the world. Okay, I'll uh, uh, push back on that a bit. Um, yes, you know, when, when I'm a phone, mobile phone user, investor user in, in Kenya, let's say, or Tanzania, or whatever, I'm sure that my data is being mined by some private company for profit. Um, I have little reason not to think that. Um, however, the company that provides that service, the mobile banking service, they do it because they get a profit from providing me with a valuable service, which I'm using to better myself. So I, I don't really see that as a problem. Um, I guess it's a question of, uh, and I, I think the biggest challenge in, in this space is um, really the, the one you raised earlier about how much we value uh, other species in their own right, as opposed to, you know, only in so far as they have utility value for, for us. And um, so far, everything we've heard today, and I think, you know, everything we see in the world suggests that, you know, it's hard to make the case to most people that um, if it comes down to a choice between who lives, this animal or, or myself, then I'll be neutral in that, <laughs> in that uh, decision. So, so I guess um, you know what is it that would? I won't say ever tip the balance because we do live in a world where human beings, you know, do dominate other animals by virtue of our, you know, our intelligence and our ability to use technology to dominate the planet. Um, whether that's good or bad, that's the reality. We live in the Anthropocene, and so that's the starting point. The question is, what do we do to mitigate our impacts on the natural negative impacts and to maximize any positive impacts we may be having and how to move from, from one to the other. And so I would suggest, even though this may not be entirely attractive to all, that placing a monetary value of some sort on, on for example, forests, like we were talking about earlier with Red Plus, um, supposing that you could actually <laughs> get someone to pay for keeping that forest intact what the opportunity cost is. And the big problem is that we don't find a way that anybody's willing to pay the farmer in Kenya or in Brazil you know, what the true opportunity cost is of keeping that forest standing. And so that is the big, the big challenge, it seems to me, because that, that benefit of keeping the forest standing is a global benefit. It's shared by literally billions of people around the world. And the cost is borne by one farmer who's decided not to clear, clear cut his farm. How do you, how do you make, you know, bridge that gap between those enjoying the benefits and the one bearing the cost? And we haven't found a way to 
to do that yet, and I don't know that we can, but I think that's that's got to happen if we're ever going to get to grips with this problem. Yeah, so maybe I'll just say this, and then we'll go um, to, to the audience. Um, you know, I don't do really disagree with anything you said, David, and I think that there are a lot of pragmatic choices we have to make at particular times. I mean, we run very quickly to these forced choice situations, me or the animal. Well, what about me and my next door neighbor? I know who I'm going to choose if it comes to, if it comes to that. Most of life is about avoiding forced choices, right, rather than sort of obsessing about what we do when we're in them. But I just want to, just as the last thing, just really pull us back. You know, there's, there's a ton of great people and great organizations doing great work. Um, but the fact is, uh, the natural world is in collapse, that uh, we're in the sixth extinction. Uh, despite all of this great work, we know where this is headed in 50 years, red plus or not red plus. We, we, we know that we're on a, tra on a trajectory of massive loss in the natural world. And I think in some way we need to go back to basics and we need to think about this much more on a sort of century timeline than on a five year, 10 year, or 20 year time, timeline. And I think that, um, that this will require a fundamental rethinking of our values and what's important to us. And we may decide that in fact, okay, we're gonna live in this human dominated world and we're, gonna, and we're gonna make the best of it. But then that's a choice that we, that, that we need to own. Instead of sort of pretending that somehow we can quote, save the natural world through a fairly motley collection, if you'll excuse the term, of very well-meaning NGOs, you know, funded by good people all over the world, an extremely weak international system, and then a system of national governments that are more or less effective, but always guided by their own national self-interest. That system is just not a system that's going to protect wild nature. Um, I just want to say one thing uh, for you, David. You were talking about um, technology. Oh, no, you are talking about technology um, and not being um, a negative thing when somebody is using your data. And then you mentioned um, nature and how humans or how animals are actually becoming extinct and the. When I was listening to her, I actually came to a realization that what was missing for both of them, if you strip the, con the, the context and you strip the labels of whether it's technology or animals, what's missing in both of them is respect. Mm -hmm. And the, the piece of respect that we have to someone's privacy is what's missing in technology. It's not the use of the, the information. Because I can choose to give it, it's not a problem. I hit consent and it's fine, but if I don't know that it's used, that's where the problem lies. And with animals too, coming and thinking that we can do certain things, or with other cultures, right? We don't come with respect. And I think that is going to what you said, Bill, about, about values. Um, I have to go back to my experience in Bali, what I have learned over there is the concept of permission. Not like we think about it in the West, can I take that, and I'll bring it back to you, but the concept of permission from a place of, um, when I enter your land, I ask permission to come into your land, right? Even, even if it's in, internal. And when I um, want to tell you a story, or I want you to do something for me, it's not because there is an exchange of money that I'm entitled right, to take it and do whatever I want with that. There is a, that, that concept that that um, value of permission does not, I find, does not exist in the West. Um, I have a question for you, Dale. Um, one of the things that I am also, besides being a jewelry designer and uh, an accidental activist and also a, a student uh, for the Glasgow University uh, College here in New York uh, for um, impact investing and sustainability in business. And that had really opened my mind to the catastrophes that are in the world because I was kind of in a bubble of 
La La Land, thinking that it's easy to make the world a better place with the Tagwasi. Uh, and what really, really uh, came to my realization is that even the UN doesn't get it right. The UN's three pillars for sustainability is people, planet, and profit. How can you make, how can you shift values that human life and environmental uh, existence and working within um, an, an international community is more important when you have profit as the third pillar? So my question to you is if you get to choose what to replace it with, what would that be? You know, we, we can write the equations for how to make profit work with preserving a whole lot of values that we have. We can talk about externalities, we can recommend various kinds of policies for internalizing those externalities, and I mean, it's not hard to do on paper. What's hard to do is to do it in practice. Um, but I think, you know, at, at, I mean, this is almost kind of a critique of all academic disciplines, if you will. At some point, we have to recognize that it's great in theory, just not in practice, so the real world had better just conform to theory. We're going to have to give up on that, and we're going to have to take the reality of how, of how a profit-motivated system actually works in the real world, and not just focus on how it could work given the nice theorems of neoclassical economics. And that requires, I think, a, you know, a really different way of thinking about things. I mean, the, 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 including, for example, paying a lot more attention uh, to indigenous knowledge and the different forms of knowledge, you know, that, um, that are subordinated around the world and, 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 and all of that. I mean, just the last thing on this. One of the things I have to say as an American that I get really, really sick of is, you know, we get this now because we have a government that a lot of us don't like and some of us are, oh my God, you know, uh, this is terrible, America's losing its leadership in the world, you know, we really need to do this so we can lead the world here. No, I'm sorry, the first principle of ethics in this world ought to be do no harm. The, the world does not need uh, the rich, over-consuming people of the world to lead it into a golden age. What the world needs from the rich, over-consuming people is to cut it out, right? I mean, I mean, the problem really begins at home. It's not about improving the welfare of other people. It's, it's about restraining these incredible causal forces that we put in motion that is creating so much of the destruction beyond the shores of this country. You are trying to oppress you when you're trying to oppress animal. And it comes to a question of value. So what are our value? It may seem utopic, but I think it's, it's very essential because when Francis Shepard said, how should we then live? It's like, if we want to live in this society and having the way of building something, a circle where everybody can kind of benefit of the, of the, for the, from the growing of the system, we should have more strong ethical value because if the, all the problems come from the leaders or whoever has the power and thinks he can oppress either a human or an animal and it comes to the same thing. So is there even possible to kind of put the value at the center of our, our discussion. Because that's where it starts. Well, I mean, this is more a philosopher's question, uh, but I, you know, I'd like to just reinforce what you were saying, because I, as I told you the other night, Dale, I, I've been reading up a bit on um, environmental ethics for my daughter's uh, school, and, um, and this, this question is posed. Um, you know, where does human empathy for or, or moral concern for other species stop, given that species range from, you know, primates to, uh, to the coronavirus. Yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, what, what is the ethical dividing line, if you will, or is there one? How do you determine, you know, where it is that we should actually, you know, hold ourselves morally responsible for the welfare of other species and where is it clearly the case that we should not or, or there's no need, there's no moral basis. So I'd like to sort of... Well, so I'm not going to answer that question, but I do... <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do want to pull something out that I think you said and really emphasize it because I think it's hugely important. 
which is there's a link between the, between humans dominating humans and humans dominating and subordinating animals. And you can even see it in the language that we use, that we, we, we use animal language for humans whom we want to dominate and, 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 and subordinate. I mean, the animal is the paradigm of the thing that we feel entitled to dominate. And so when we dominate other people, we say, oh, they're like animals, they're like dogs, they're like, they're like this, and they're like that. So I, I mean, so sometimes people try to break apart this idea. Do we care about people or do you care about animals? Well, actually, in the structure of hierarchy and, and domination, uh, it is the same. I mean, I mean, there's no difference between them. If you examine the thought of these animals, some of them very intelligent, you look at China, they're breeding them for food. So it's not just the wild animals in the wild, it's animals in the world that need justice, as well as people. You have now in India, they're treating the fourth group there, they, they don't have papers, they don't have any type of authority, and soon they're not going to be a part or an Indian citizen if they can't prove who they are and where they were born. So I think it's people and animals we have to look at together. I agree with you thinking of an animal as a human being. Yeah. Amen. I know I'm probably the only thing between you and uh, a drink. And you know, your ears are full of uh, different dialogues around conservation. The idea of man and um, animal is one. Gloria just said, how many of us know how many people, uh, how many animals died in the fires that just took place in, the, in Australia? Does someone want to take a guess? Can you imagine what would happen if a billion people vanished from the face of this earth because of the coronavirus? We wouldn't have the same response as we have to the bushfires. We have approximately, I think, 3,000 people dead from the coronavirus right now, give or take more. How much of an alarm have we had on the entire planet for that? Pretty much on somewhere between red alert and oh my god, I don't want to touch your hand anymore. <laughs> now, I come from a world that supports life of every form, starting with us. And I'm a firm believer that in order to conserve the planet, it has to begin on the inside. In order to have real impact on the outside world, which is life on land, you have to have inner transformation. And I don't think any of you uh, here don't do your inner work, but we often shield from what I think is the most important part of our inner work, which is the ego. And I feel like ego has driven us to destroy the world we live in by creating the world we want. Right, so if we look out there right now, there's an extraordinary world out there. We have technology, we have everything we need to serve form of life that serves humanity. But I don't think it serves the planet. I don't think it serves the animals. Imagine if in one click God decided, just like the coronavirus, to give every animal the same level of consciousness we humans have. What do you think would happen to us if a lion all of a sudden could think like we do. If an ape, we've seen this in movies like, who have seen Rise of the Apes over here? <laughs> right, we've seen it. And if that ever happened, right, we would have a completely different worldview of how to treat animals. And I think what I'm trying to say here is, well, this is the African Symposium. And there's a beautiful proverb that I learned in Africa. Um, it said that if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together, yeah. right? And I think that's something that we're very uh, bad at here and now. Because if you look at the world, we, we're boiling the oceans. 
We're making life on land suffer at a rate that they don't even have control over. We, we're literally seeing species go extinct in a way that we do not have any care or concern for the true well-being of life on land. So I would say the most important thing here and now is for us to really start to do more of the inner work that is necessary, not just as human beings, as individuals, but as communities. See, the truth is, when a community actually gets together and decides to make a law, um, it serves the entire planet. When a person does that, they often have to become a Mahatma Gandhi or a Malala or a Greta Thunberg before anyone even notices. More often than not, you see action take place on that community level. And that can spread to a national level. And that can spread to a world level. A friend of mine wrote a book called OMD, One Meal a Day. When I first saw it, I thought, oh my God, this will make me get back into the best shape of my life. And I went up to her and asked her to sign it. And then I realized the thesis behind the book. And she said, no, I don't want you to eat one meal a day. I want you to sacrifice one meal a day to be just vegetarian, that doesn't have an animal on the plate. And that way we will not only reverse climate change, but we'll also save the lives of so many animals that are endlessly suffering a slaughterhouse continuum that we have created. Now, I felt so much um, pain after that meeting with her because for the first time in my life, I was reminded that I'm one of those perpetrators, you see? And there's a continuum where there's the perpetrator, collaborator, victim, and the bystander. And then I also realized that, my God, not only am I a perpetrator, but I'm also a bystander. And then I made a pledge to myself that I will make sure that I go from being a perpetrator to activating to become a guardian angel, which is when a bystander becomes a guardian angel, because the bystander actually has a lot of power. They're kind of like the fulcrum of any movement, right? And if we want to save the victims, which are the animals in this case, we all have to stop being bystanders. So on that note, I would love to frame this in a way that there's an extraordinary woman that's coming on stage. And there was a there was a movement we started at the UN last year called First Woman. And the, the initial idea behind First Woman was to put First Woman on the moon by 2024. But I really believe that women as a force for good, as a force of nature for the future, would be able to really re reverse a lot of the problems we face here and now with conservation. One of the reasons I, I believe this is because there are mothers. And they understand life intrinsically from a, being a mother, a maternal, uh, from a maternal instinct. So what I would say is, um, for us here and now, we've heard about exponential technologies, we've heard about all sorts of different policies and things that are being done in the world. Really just the most important thing that we can focus on for here and now is just to commit to not being a bystander in situations where you can make a difference. And I'm not saying you have to go out and like stop eating meat. You know, you can, it's, it's probably not sustainable to some people, but I do think you can start by just looking at where you can make a difference in your life. I do that for myself, whether it's, you know, at the high towers of the UN or in the slums of Mumbai. I try to make a difference in every single place I, I touch with my work. So that's my message to you guys, and I would love for you all to join me, you know, we, we launched something called We the Planet, which is about we the people, but it's something larger than us. It's about we the planet. And I believe that here and now we have to go above and beyond ourselves and look at the planet as something that gives us everything we have as a gift. And really, this is the decade that we can make the difference. This is truly the decade, not just because the global goals are going to end in 2030, but because science, as well as I think our intuition is telling us that we're starting to see the signs of it's going to get a little too late, pretty soon. You know, and the coronavirus is just the beginning. I mean, if that's Mother Nature's way of telling us, we have to wake up 
you know, I hate to say when Mother Nature really wakes up because really speaking more than, you know, the world, we need to come uh, and have peace with the wildlife, with nature, with Mother Nature in the world. And so I, I would really invite you all to just do your part, you know, be good stewards of the planet. That's what I do every day of my life. And with that, I'd love to invite and thank our curator for the day, Ade, who deserves a massive applause. Um, because the first time, you know, what I do is I'm a curator, and, and the first way of getting people to take action is to create a awareness. And these summits are about awareness. And the awareness that we can give you here and now with all these perspectives is what you should leave with and really make yourself, you know, the exponential leader that not, you don't just leave a great planet for your kids, but you leave an extraordinary gener generation of extraordinary citizens for the future of the planet. So with that, I'd like Ade to say a few words. Um, and I'll stay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ade Haidu. I'm the founder of African Symposium and also the organizer of this conference. Uh, I want to first start by thanking every single one of you um, for one of you in this room for coming here and uh, making my dream come true really of hosting an event that, about something that I really, really care about and that I'm very passionate about, which is animals. Um, yes, so you're all compassionate people, obviously that's why you're here and I really appreciate you. Uh, so African Symposium is a full service event planning company that focuses on Africa and sustainable development goals. Uh, after this, we I'm planning to launch this in Africa, um, as well as you know, next year we'll, we'll, we'll do another one here, but uh, we'd also like to do it in uh, different countries in Africa. Um, as you can tell, I'm, I'm a conference producer, I'm an event planner, not a speaker, so <laughs> bear with me. I, I normally don't go up stage, on stage, but um, so I quickly want to tell you the inspiration behind uh, doing this conference, and those are it's two uh, individuals who are no longer alive, uh, Michael Warike uh, and uh, Hezi uh, Shoshani, an uh, Israeli man who did a lot of work in uh, Ethiopia and, is, uh, and uh, Eritrea on elephants. Uh, he's also not alive, but they were very, very inspirational um, because, and I, I think I wanted to really bring up their names because I felt like they were being forgotten even though they did such amazing work. Um, and I feel, I would like to challenge you when you go home to um, Google them and if you don't already know about them and keep their memories alive. Um, the other one that I didn't mention is Michael Warike. He's a Kenyan man. He was the, the rhino man who used to um, walk from Mombasa to Kenya by foot just to educate uh, the, the community around about the fact that um, killing rhinos is really not it's, not, it's not serving you and why they shouldn't do it. Um, in the end, they were both had a very tragic tragic deaths, um, but uh, I think we, we could do, we could you know, keep their memories alive. But I also wanted to say that we have a very, very special guest today. Um, she's right here, uh, Francine Lefrat from uh, <laughs> Saint Sky Foundation, who um, is a, an organization that does amazing work in, in uh, Rwanda with women. And I think I'm not going to do too much. I, I want her to come up here and say a few words about about uh, the organization. Hi everyone, I'm Francine Lefrac. This is Jill Abrahams, who's the head of the Same Sky Foundation. And I see Gloria in the front, which is why I'm here. But I want to tell you a happy story. A story that started 12 years ago, where my journey took me to Kigali, Rwanda, where I met women who had survived the Rwandan genocide, who literally had been raped and were HIV and had no means of support, and were planning their death. And 
I got this idea that what could I do, and I knew I was always good as a producer, as a movie producer, but I was always good with having taste in jewelry, and I saw that the women were amazingly talented with their hands, so I started a jewelry company called Same Sky, the idea that we're all under the same sky, we see the same stars and the same moon, and we have the same dream. So this necklace and this bracelet were made by these women artisans, and their life totally changed by giving them a job, because for me, the greatest philanthropy is a job, not a handout. And every bead represented, represented hope for a woman who had very little. Take Clementine, who was not only couldn't read or write, but couldn't, you know, her, was, had terrible HIV numbers. Once she started to work, her life was transformed. She opened a bank account, her kids slept on mattresses, she even gave birth to a non-HIV baby, learned how to read and write, and now she works in a collective, and she has a, a life full of purpose, and she has safety in her community because she has respect. But working with these women taught me that what am I going to do? Now, when you go outside, you'll see a table of the jewelry that was made by the women, and I was helping at the time 200 women, and I started to sort of say, wait a minute, I want to help more. How can I multiply this effect? It, you know, how can I scale this business? And I realized it was through business training and education. So we started working with the women to train them. And I'm, you probably can't see this, but it helps me. And they, so I didn't have to send them beads from America, and I didn't have to come up with designs. They could make their own baskets and bags. And it's a, such a happy story because they started selling them to Target, to Bed Bath & Beyond, to uh, West Elm. And now 600 women are running businesses and making more money than when I was paying them to make jewelry. So I think they deserve a round of applause. Thank you. So they even started their own credit union, and we even trained Burundian refugees in refugee camps in Rwanda, and right now we're training um, Congolese refugees in, in refugee camps in Rwanda to be self-sustaining to get out of the refugee camps, to find homes, but now they can earn a living. So that's one part of what we do. The other part of what we do is this amazing school in Rwanda called the Fawe School, and we've supported 50 students to get scholars at the Fawe School. And these girls were at risk because they didn't have enough money to pay to go to school. And they're studying science and math and, and farming techniques and technology and they're in the medical profession. A number of them want to be neuroscientists and, and um, they're amazing girls. And I'd like to actually read you something that one of them wrote to me just the other day. She said, my name is Mutesi Joyce. I'm 23 years old in the third year university and a same size scholar at the Uni University of Rwanda School of Agriculture. I'm in crop science department studying crop science and forestry. I'm so grateful for the support and chance given to me by the Same Sky Foundation. Same Sky Foundation is a godsend in many ways. I had dropped out of the Fawe School because the two school fees were too high and I had no hope of getting sponsorship. My parents are peasant farmers and I have a lot, they have a lot of children to take care of. I have absolutely no idea how I could graduate from high school and study in the university and achieve my dream of being an agriculture specializing in crop science. I didn't know how I could do this. Um, when I was accepted into the scholarship program, it felt like the door to my future opened, and I worked hard to achieve highly academically. At the university, I've been excelling in academics, and this year I'm set to graduate first in my class. 
Studying at the university with the Same Sky Scholarship has been invaluable to me and offered many lessons, skills, a pathway, and a community that has helped me to define, understand, and focus my goal to become a leader and a scientist. Currently, I'm a student leader at the university and carry my leadership experience to my community in advocating for women's rights and girl empowerment and also transfer my agricultural knowledge and experts to farmers to help them grow food production. Thank you, Same Sky Foundation, and I encourage you to continue supporting more impoverished girls in Rwanda to achieve their dream in education. So I'd like you to give Joyce a round of applause, too. <laughs> so if any of you would like to support any of these girls, Jill will tell you how to do it, or help with training women in Rwanda to, to fulfill their dreams, support their families, and lift themselves out of poverty through their own talents. I'm going to turn this over to Jill now. Thank you. So for $500, and a group of people can come together to do this, you can support one girl for a year to attend school. And when you think about it, and she'll write to you. She'll tell you about what she's achieved and how it's changing her life. So if anyone is interested in that, or in supporting an artisan so that they can get additional business training, and that's a gift of $1,000, you can go online to samesky.com and hit the Donate Now button, and you can definitely make a gift online. It'll tell you how to mail a check. But really, for what seems like an enormous amount of money to each of these women and girls, in America, it's not a significant amount of money that will change a life. And when you think about the power that we all have to change that life, it's pretty incredible. So if anyone's interested in learning more, I'll be outside and I'm happy to answer any questions and give you some additional information. But thank you for letting us be here today to talk to you about the work that's not only our work, but our true passion. So thank you. Thank you. I'm very proud of that day. She's a close friend, and when she first told me her idea of having this symposium, I told her it wouldn't be easy, but this is the start of an annual event. So those of you who are here can help us for the next event, and I'm sure a day will be in touch with all of you. I'm very happy to introduce her mother, Mrs. Halu, who is based in South Africa and one of the key people of the African Development <coughs> Bank. So I really feel that my mother should say a few words. Thank you, Gloria, and thank you everyone for coming to this event and give support to Ade. Yeah, as Gloria has already said, when she started, we didn't think you know, it would be an easy job to do, but now I'm really very impressed and happy that with all the support she got around her, this has been successful. Yes. Thank you.